Hi, welcome to Save the Frogs Academy. My name is Dr. Carrie Krieger. I am the founder and executive director of Save the Frogs. And today we are going to be talking about the Sharp Park wetlands and the California red-legged frogs that live there and the city of San Francisco and what they're doing on the property which they own. And we're also going to be talking about American bullfrogs, which are an invasive species in the in many states in the Western USA and in at least 15 countries around the world where they do not belong. So for the first half hour, we have Brent Plater of the Wild Equity Institute, who will be telling us all about Sharp Park. And then for the second half hour, we have Chris Berry of the Santa Cruz Water Department and Santa Cruz County Fish and Game Department, who's going to be talking about our Save the Frogs efforts to get the importation of bullfrogs into California stopped. So I'm going to start out and just let Brent tell you about Sharp Park for, I think, about 20 minutes he's going to speak, and then we'll have five minutes or so for questions, and then I'll save five minutes to run you through the Save the Frogs Sharp Park page, and then we'll turn it over to Chris. So we're very happy to have Brent on the line. I've known him for several years, and he's an extremely dedicated environmentalist with some or a lot of environmental law experience. And I'm going to turn it over to Brent. And Brent, feel free to introduce yourself as well. So let's uh, turn over the screen to you. Here it comes. All right, Brent, you should be gaining control of the screen. All right, can you um, can you see my screen now? Let's see. Give me one second. I can see your screen. Very good. Well, thanks for the introduction, Carrie. Hi, everybody. As Carrie said, my name is Brent Plater. I run an organization called the Wild Equity Institute. This is just a little screenshot from our homepage. It's a relatively new organization we founded just a few years ago to try and build some alliances between the traditional grassroots conservation organizations in the world with environmental justice and social justice organizations that we believe have a shared identity, a shared moral foundation in this concept of equity, that there is a shared objective, ultimate objective across these movements of trying to create a more just, a more fair world because we see some imbalance in power or some unjust things happening to people in certain instances, but also to other species and to the land in other instances. And so what we try to do is come up with campaigns that can bring those organizations together where they have a shared objective or can battle a shared threat. And through that philosophy, through that theory of change, we came across this issue happening at Sharp Park. Sharp Park is a, um, a public park that's owned by the city and county of San Francisco. I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. But we came up with a, an uh, objective of restoring this landscape to create a new national park on the vision in partnership with the uh, two communities that are interested in this area, a town called Pacifica in the city and county of San Francisco, and the National Park Service, which just so happens to own a couple of national park properties adjacent to Sharp Park already. So to give you some context, uh, I'm here in San Francisco. This is, of course, a screenshot of the western United States. And San Francisco, as I mentioned, the city and county of San Francisco actually owns this land called Sharp Park. But Sharp Park is not found in San Francisco. It's actually located in another community about 15 minutes south of San Francisco called Pacifica. And you can see here this area that's highlighted as Laguna Salada. This landscape here going out to the east, upland and inland from the ocean, and then all across um, to where my cursor is pointing right now, this giant rectangle is a public park owned and operated by the city and county of San Francisco that's adjacent to a national park property just to the south called Mori Point. 
There are some protected San Francisco Utilities Commission lands up here to the southeast. And then a national par property that's just off your screen called Sweeney Ridge, which is where an explorer named Portola actually discovered San Francisco Bay. Now, San Francisco came to acquire this landscape largely to settle a political grudge, but it came with a, a, a catch. This is actually a copy of the deed that gave Sharp Park to the city and county of San Francisco. And, and they chose San Francisco at the time because it, it, at, at, in, those, in those days, San Francisco was really the only government around. Pacifica hadn't really it hadn't been formed yet. But it came with a little hitch when they gave this land to the city. And it says on this third line that the city and county of San Francisco may use land only for a public park or a public playground. It has to be one of those two things. If it doesn't, it reverts to the errors of the original donee. And who knows who those people are at these days. So the probability of this land ever being developed into a commercial housing development is zero. Um, the only question is what kind of a public uh, recreational park or playground it will become. Well, before Sharp Park uh, came what it became what it is today, it was this wonderful, vibrant coastal lagoon system. You can see Laguna Salada here was much larger at the time and uh, was surrounded. These, these little hash marks indicate uh, a wetland environment. And there was this dune barrier system that protected this lagoon, which was largely fresh with maybe a little bit of brackish intermingling uh, over here um, from, from ocean storm surges. And you can also see from, from this map, which overlays existing roads with the original topography of the landscape, that Sharp Park is a low point in this relatively large watershed. Watershed's maybe 800 acres or so. And so all the water that falls in this watershed eventually ends up in Laguna Salada. When that happens, the lagoon starts to rise slowly until eventually the water overtops the dune barrier that protects the lagoon system from the ocean, and there's a release of the water out to the ocean. That was, that's what used to happen under natural conditions. But when San Francisco acquired the property, they had a different vision for the land, and they hired this guy, a guy named Alistair McKenzie, a very famous golf architect, to destroy it, to, to, uh, to develop a golf course on the property. And Alistair McKenzie is an interesting guy because he was one of the golf architects who really attempted to try and integrate natural features into the golf courses that he designed. But at Sharp Park, for some reason, he took a very different approach. He created this golf course here, um, which you can see in this slide, um, which did a couple of things. First of all, he filled in much of Laguna Salada to create these golf links around the edges of the lagoon. And he also bulldozed the ocean ber berms, these dunes, that were protecting Laguna Salada and all of Sharp Park from ocean storm surges. And that was an enormous ecological mistake. Um, first of all, by placing a golf course in this location at the very bottom of the watershed, it consistently has water management problems. It's one of the few golf courses in the world that has too much water in its system for most of the year. But then by destroying the dune barrier system that protected the lagoon and laying out these links along the sea, it provided an opportunity for coastal storm surges to bring coastal storm water all the way up to the clubhouse, uh, which happened on several occasions in the early decades of the lagoon. The clubhouse is located right around here where my cursor is pointing. And so over time, this original golf course was completely lost, and it became the version that we have today. This is a satellite image of the golf course presently. And what you see is all the links along the western side of the lagoon have been lost. They've been moved over here to the eastern side of Highway 101. And several others had to be rerouted uh, due to maintenance issues, et cetera. Now, over time, to defend the golf course from these coastal storm surges, the city and county of San Francisco erected a coastal seawall along Sh Sharp Park's western border to try and mimic the dune protections that were once provided there. Now, this has become a problem because as sea level rise rises and coastal storm surge intensity increases, when you try to put a, a hard line along the coast as a coastal defense mechanism, you eventually get ocean storm surges hitting that um, 
that, that line in the sand that we've created, this, this structure, which eliminates the recreational and habitat values of the beach in front of it. You lose that beach altogether. And on top of that, you create a system which is vulnerable to a Katrina-like catastrophic flooding event. There's a breach in this berm. You'll get ocean stormwaters rushing into the remaining elements of the lagoon, which will drastically change the ecology of that landscape. Now, when they built that, that berm to try and stop the ocean stormwaters, they also blocked the outflow of fresh waters out to the ocean. And so today, Sharp Park Golf Course still suffers from flooding. This is a photograph that Carrie and I took a while back when we were visiting the site. But it floods not from seawater anymore, but from ocean storm surges. Uh, I'm sorry, from, from, uh, from, coast, from, from, from freshwater rains. And so for many days of the year, the golf course is unplayable uh, because it's basically the lagoon is trying to re reclaim its original footprint. So to solve that problem, the city and county of San Francisco constructed a pump house. This is a picture of the pump house, and they were constructing some pipes that would go through the berm to allow this pump house, which can take out uh, theoretically about 10,000 gallons of water per minute, and send it through the berm out to the ocean so the golf course wouldn't flood. And that brings us to the story of our frog. This is, of course, the California red-legged frog. The California red-legged frog is the largest and probably most famous frog in the state of California. Some people call it Twain's frog because Mark Twain wrote a short story many years ago called The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County. And at that time, because the California red-legged frog was the largest frog in the West, that was the one that had the greatest jumping ability. And so the California red-legged frog was traditionally the frog used in those jumping frog competitions. Today, uh, imported bullfrogs, which we'll talk about more later on, are the primary frog that are used in those competitions, but people call this frog Twain's frog sometimes because of its, um, its association with Mark Twain. Unfortunately, the California red-legged frog is no longer found in Calaveras County except for a very small population on private lands that was recently discovered. It's been lost from about 70% uh, of its historic range, 90% population declines overall, and because of this, it's been protected as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. Now, the California red-legged frog is a very interesting frog because it, when, it, when it breeds, when the winter rains come, that triggers the frogs to breed. And the frog will lay its eggs and attach it to a piece of aquatic vegetation. So it'll look something like this. Now, the problem is, because it's attached to aquatic vegetation, if the water in the lagoon system is drained away from the, uh, from the areas where the frog has laid its eggs, these eggs will be exposed to the air, and eventually you lose the egg mass altogether. You can kill all the eggs in the egg mass, and you can literally lose an entire generation of frogs in one night. And the problem at Sharp Park is that we have a population of the California red-legged frog, which has been found at Sharp Park and at the adjacent National Park properties. And the National Park is investing millions of dollars in a recovery effort, habitat restoration effort, for the restoration of this species and the next species we'll talk about in a second. And at the same time, right next door, Sharp Park Golf Course every winter, by turning these pumps on to prevent the golf course from flooding, is killing California red-legged frog egg masses once they've been laid. Now, there's a second endangered species that's found in this Maury Point Sharp Park system, and this is the one that truly breaks my heart. This is the San Francisco garter snake. And this snake has been deemed by scientists, so it's objective truth that it's both the most beautiful and most imperiled serpent in all of North America. It had a very limited range to begin with, it was largely based in San Mateo County alone, and after San Mateo County became developed, most of its habitats were lost. But since 1985, the Fish and Wildlife Service has had a recovery plan for this federally endangered species that said they have the, to recover the species, we need to secure the six remaining viable populations of the species and then recreate four more in places where they've been lost from in order for the species to recover. One of those six populations was the Sharp Park Maury Point population. And unfortunately, over time, instead of growing that population high enough so that individuals from those populations could be reintroduced in other parts of its historic range, the population's actually been crashing again 
because of the golf course. Golf courses, as you probably realize, require lawnmowers, garter snakes like uh, the San Francisco garter snake feed in aquatic environments. At Shark Park, the aquatic lagoons are surrounded by tees and greens and fairways that require lawnmowers. And every now and then, a lawnmower runs over a San Francisco garter snake out there like this one. It's the Fish and Wildlife Service concluded was killed by the operations and management of Shark Park just a few years ago. Now, the population of the snake out there is so low, probably in the tens, that it doesn't happen every day. But every time one of these instances happens, the entire population there is put in jeopardy. So uh, because of these environmental constraints and also because of other forces, on top of all these things, Sharp Park Golf Course loses a significant amount of money. There have been many media reports about this in recent years. It loses between $100,000 and $300,000 a year. And because it's owned by the city and county of San Francisco, our general fund dollars subsidize this suburban golf course in San Mateo County that's killing two endangered species to the tune of several hundred thousand dollars a year. While at the same time, the city and county of San Francisco, like many municipalities struggling with the economic recession, has been reducing funding for social services and neighborhood parks and community services. So what we've been doing is working both with conservation groups like Carry and Save the Frogs, but also community organizations in the city that are concerned about the services for the poor or, or neighborhood community centers for, for kids after school to convince the Board of Supervisors of San Francisco to close this money-losing golf course, take the money that it saves and reinvest it in the things San Franciscans actually demand, and then give the land management of Sharp Park to the National Park Service, which is already operating a robust recovery action right next door to create a new national park that everybody can enjoy, not just golfers. And so this is our vision. We want to create a new restored landscape at Sharp Park that everybody can enjoy with trails that are safe for wildlife, restored habitat, um, recreational opportunities like camping, and other activities that are consistent with the National Park Service's mission. And the Park Service is very interested in this because this clubhouse, the golf course clubhouse that exists on the property, would be a great visitor center for the National Park Service. The Park Service, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, has a lot of lands in San Mateo County these days, but no visitor services. And so they've been looking for a spot like this to transform into a headquarters for their San Mateo County lands. Now, there's a lot of great reasons to, um, to work on, on, this, on this project beyond the uh, activities of, that are happening here with Sharp Park Golf Course. It also turns out that um, San Franciscans actually have their number one recreational preference and need is for more walking and biking trails. In the same uh, surveys, golf comes in 16th out of the 19 options that the city provides in terms of recreational activities. So we can help bring supply of our recreational services closer to modern demand simply by closing this one course and creating a uh, new national park at Sharp Park with trails and other opportunities for people to enjoy uh, what modern recreation demands suggest that people desire. There's another threat out there at Sharp Park, which I mentioned briefly, which is coastal storm surges and sea level rise. Um, at Sharp Park, we already know that the 100-year coastal flood event is going to uh, subsume most of the low-lying lands of Laguna Salada unless something is done about it. There are two major strategies to do something about it. One is to armor the coastline, which as I mentioned before, would allow us to lose the beach. But at Sharp Park, because so much public property is owned upland and inland, we have a very real possibility, without having to condemn people's property through eminent domain, to allow the coastline to shift upland in, inland and reconstruct wetlands that were once there to help protect the community from flooding. So that's another part of our vision, is to make this area more adaptable to the changes that are and challenges that are posed by climate change and sea level rise. And another reason is national parks, as we know, are great economic engines. There's been many reports about this. And the local economy in Pacifica has been struggling as well. The golf course has been unsuccessful in generating revenue for the community down there. It's been losing money on its own terms as it is. But national parks do drive tourism dollars into local communities and the key part of that opportunity is having a visitor center, a southern gateway to the national park properties in, of the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. So this has a lot of reasons. There's, there's almost too many reasons to do this. We have so many good things to talk about. 
But of course, there's opposition. There, are, the golf course itself, and some of the golfers that use it have been vehement in saying that no golf course should close in the Bay Area these days. And in fact, they've been quite hostile. Um, they even redesigned their original logo. This is the original logo uh, for Sharp Park Golf Course to this after they got caught by us and others for killing California red-legged frogs. They redesigned it to make this character of the red-legged frog leaning against this golf ball from uh, being in play and arguing that the golf course is nothing more than the home of the red-legged frog, which was very disingenuous because we've been working with them for many years to try and stop this illegal killing, and they were just very truculent about it. So there's, there is some opposition, and so we definitely need some help to make this happen. If you're interested in participating in the campaign and helping us implement this positive restoration vision for frogs, snakes, and, and everybody else, you can reach us at wildequity.org or give us a call. Our number's up there on the screen, 415-349-5787. Or, or send us an email at info at wildequity.org, and we'll get you in, in touch with the people who are working on the campaign to make this vision a reality. Thanks a lot, Brent. I think that's everything I got. Thanks, okay, Jim. excellent. Let me switch the screen back to me. If anybody has any questions for Brent about Sharp Park or the frogs that live there, then please go ahead and send them in by chat, or you can raise your hand. And uh, if you have a microphone, we can unmute you. Okay, so on our Save the Frogs webpage, savethefrogs.com, from the homepage, you can scroll down to click the Sharp Park link, which is in our left sidebar. And you'll get to our Sharp Park page, savethefrogs.com slash sharp dash park. And it's got lots of info about the park and what's going on there, some history of the park. It's got some flyers that you can post that you can print out and post either on your website or print them and put them up somewhere. And some of the history about some of the legal findings at Sharp Park, what Mayor Ed Lee did, which was veto legislation that saved the frogs and wild equity helped get in place that would have helped protect frogs there. That was passed by the County Board of Supervisors on several occasions, but Mayor Lee, who is a golf enthusiast, vetoed the legislation, and he did that without ever meeting with any environmental group that was requesting a meeting, such as Save the Frogs and Wild Equity. So on this page, it's got several things you can do, calling the mayor's office. If you want to volunteer and help out on this campaign, please let us know got a list of some of the politicians in San Francisco that support our vision of Sharp Park. It's got a list of some of the politicians who have been against frog conservation at Sharp Park. So you can contact them or think about how you vote at the next San Francisco voting. Some pictures of the pump shooting water out of, park, out of Sharp Park, egg masses drying up, and some videos you can watch. Lots of reading if you want to read all about Sharp Park and some of the history of Sharp Park. And it's got some pictures from Save the Frogs events. We've had a couple Sharp Park related protests and rallies. This was Drumming for the Frogs. May 19th, 2012 took place at the golf course right outside the clubhouse where on that day they were actually celebrating um, a golf-related event, including fundraising to raise money for the legal efforts to keep the golf course as a golf course and not enact the pro-frog changes that we seek. So they were raising money for that. So we were down there with drums to raise some noise for the frogs immediately outside of their clubhouse. And we got lots of news publicity from that. Another event 
that you can see right here, Brent is up at City Hall and we had about 100 supporters from Wild Equity, Save the Frogs, Center for Biological Diversity, um, the Homies, and I think another group or two from San Francisco came together, 100 people on Save the Frogs Day 2011 to um, speak up for the frogs. And based on that, we did get some legislation through that John Avalos sponsored. And as I said, it got passed by the county of San Francisco, the county board three times, but Mayor Ed Lee vetoed that legislation. And then we also have some um, input from other scientists who have worked at the site. And you can read that, savethefrogs.com slash sharp dash park. Just go click the Sharp Park link on the left side of our page. Thank you very much to Brent Plater from the Wild Equity Institute. You can go check out their website, wildequity.org. So on that note, let's see, we do have a question. And I will let Brent answer this. Would restoration include rebuilding the dunes? So Brent, can you tell us something about uh, the dunes and how they relate to the restoration vision? Yes. Um, the plan that we've put together, and we, we have a peer-reviewed study that investigates the restoration options for the landscape, would include recreating the dunes over a uh, fairly, uh, um, sort of over, over the medium term, but ensuring that the dunes have the ability to migrate inland and upland at the sea level rise and coastal storm surges. Because what happens naturally with coastal lagoons, and there's evidence of this across ecological time, where there have been large shifts in sea level rise due to ice caps being formed, et cetera, is the ocean will very slowly take the sand and push it inland by overtopping every now and then the existing dune bank and filling in the coastal edge of the lagoon, which then pushes the water inland and upland over time. And what you get over time is this dynamic system that allows the lagoons to persist as we use the energy from the sea level rise and the ocean tides to allow those landscapes to migrate inland and upland just in the nick of time as sea level rise. It just happens, happens uh, spontaneously, as it were. So the plan would be to allow that to happen over time. We wouldn't, right now, the, the best um, suggestions that we've been able to incorporate would allow, would suggest that we take the existing dune embankment, which is basically an earthen berm, and allow the waves to actually make that dune formation happen for us, rather than tearing it down directly, because that'll save a lot of money and also um, probably a little, a little bit more resilient system than if we were to try to design it on our own. All right, thanks a lot. Again, everybody out there, if you have any questions, you can send them in, or if you want to ask your question on a microphone, you could raise your hand. And another question, which seems, uh, I'll, I'll let Brent say something about it. Doesn't the pump putting fresh water into the ocean also waste valuable fresh water? I know in Santa Cruz, we have significant water problems that we'll be hearing about from our other panelist, Chris Berry, soon. And throughout the American West, there are plenty of water problems. And I'm pretty sure that San Francisco gets a lot of their water from out at Hetch Hetchy or somewhere a long way from San Francisco. So Brent, do you have any thoughts on the waste of fresh water that is pumped out by the Saint, by the Shark Park pump house. Now that's a fair point. Um, there are far better uses that we can think of for fresh water than um, flooding a golf course, for example. Um, what what we've proposed to use this fresh water for is to help recreate habitat for these imperiled species. That would be a far better use for it. And um, you know, when they pump it out to the ocean just to keep the golf course from flooding. Uh, it has uh, a very a negative consequence on the kinds of things we could use that, that fresh water for. So I think that's a very good point. Thanks. All right, final chance for questions. Anything about Sharp Park, San Francisco, 
California red-legged frog, San Francisco garter snakes. Okay, if you think of anything else, you're welcome to send it in, but we are going to switch gears to Chris Berry from the Santa Cruz Water Department and Santa Cruz Fish and Game Commission. And Chris is on our Save the Frogs Advisory Committee, and he's been working with me for the past um, couple of years to deal with the California bullfrog problem. And let's get our bullfrog page here. It's savethefrogs.com slash bullfrogs. Savethefrogs.com slash bullfrogs. And I'll just give a quick overview of the bullfrog problem before we switch it over to Chris. Basically, bullfrogs are native to the eastern half of North America, and they got imported into California a little over 100 years ago when the Californian gold miners ate most of the California red-legged frogs, which is the original reason that the red-legged frogs became endangered. Once there was less of a food source, some people started bringing in bullfrogs and raising them, and they've escaped and taken over much of the western U.S. and Canada. Bullfrogs are the largest frog in North America, which means they have big legs and a lot of meat on their legs, so people like to farm them for food. That's how they originally got here, and now they're farmed all around the world in frog farms. And the frog farms are raising American bullfrogs, even if they're, say, in China, Taiwan, Uruguay, Brazil, because the bullfrogs are relatively easy to grow and they produce a lot of meat on their legs. Then the bullfrogs can escape their farms in that foreign country and become invasive species there, eating native frogs, competing with wildlife, native wildlife for habitat, spreading diseases in their country where that farm is, and then they get shipped to America. And in California, several million are imported into the state each year, primarily for use as food. They're also used as pets. They're used in dissections too, but food is the number one problem. And same thing happens here. They'll either escape because a lot of them are coming in alive or they get set free. Sometimes people who think they're doing a good thing by setting an animal free, let it go, and it goes out into the wild and spreads its disease because the bullfrogs frogs have very high rates of chytrid fungus. One study showed that 62% of the frogs coming into California were infected with the chytrid fungus, which causes chytridiomycosis, which has driven about 100 amphibian species to complete extinction around the world and is known to cause problems in California. So the frogs get out there and they eat native frogs, spread their diseases, and we don't want them coming into California because it's not good for California native ecosystems or wildlife. It's on our savethefrogs.com slash bullfrogs page. We've got lots of info about the bullfrog. There he is right there. And we have a free PDF you can download that I wrote, Controlling the Threat of Invasive American Bullfrogs. It's about six or seven pages with a lot of information on bullfrogs. So on this webpage, we tell you how the bullfrogs got here, what the problem is with them eating native species, how they're spreading diseases, a little history of Save the Frogs, which I think Chris will talk about, otherwise I'll... Um, talk about it again afterwards. But basically, we've delivered over a thousand petitions to the California government. We've spent a lot of time speaking to the California Department of Fish and Game. They have not helped us at all. They issue the permits for people to import the bullfrogs, and yet they claim they have no ability to stop doing that, which seems counterintuitive to me. If you issue the permits, you should be able to stop the permits but we'll let Chris talk about that. We have a petition here. You can print out the PD, download the PDF, print it, collect some signatures, petition to ban the importation of bullfrogs in California. Chris will tell you about our legislative victories in Santa Cruz, getting the prohibition on bullfrogs, and 
Uh, anyone who wants to learn about the economics of bullfrogs can read about that on our page. And at the bottom of the page, we've got lots of additional reading, some scientific studies, from le some letters from scientists um, stating their problems they have with bullfrogs and why we do need to control the problem. So go check out savethefrogs.com slash bullfrogs. And I am going to turn it over to Chris right now. Chris, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, here we go. So you should be getting controls showing up on your screen. Can, can everybody see my screen? Uh, let's see. Yes. You're live. Do you, uh, are you seeing the go to panel on the side there? Uh, I don't see. No, I don't think anyone should see that. Okay, good. Well, thanks for having me, Brent. I really enjoyed your presentation and Carrie, thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, yeah, it's a little confusing. My background, I'm actually representing the city of Santa Cruz Water Department. Um, I do serve on the um, County of Santa Cruz Fish and Game Commission and a couple other commissions as well as on the advisory panel for Save the Frogs. Um, so I'm happy to be able to join you guys today and talk about what we're doing here in Santa Cruz. Um, in a nutshell, I was going to talk about what brought me to Save the Frogs and working on the bullfrog issue, which is the city of Santa Cruz HCP. Um, I did have a question for Brent, which we didn't have time for, but at some point I'd like to hear what the city and county of San Francisco are doing in terms of their Endangered Species Act compliance, because obviously they have um, some legal liability there in terms of in that regard. So um, the city of Santa Cruz Water Department, whom I'm an employee of, serves about 93 to 95,000 people with drinking water in the Santa Cruz and surrounding areas. Um, we have a um, very old water system that was, some parts of the water system are over 100 years old. So um, like you saw in San Francisco, we have some antiquated practices that we're trying to bring into the 21st century with greater consideration for protection of our native biodiversity, including the California red-legged frog primarily. Um, what I do for the city of Santa Cruz is I'm the watershed compliance manager. So that's a, a little bit of a tongue twister, but in a nutshell, I deal with drinking water source protection, which is dr driven by the Safe Drinking Water Act, meaning that I'm supposed to protect the watersheds that provide drinking water to the city. Um, and I also do environmental regulatory compliance, primarily on the city's operations. So while I'm also watchdogging people up in the watersheds to make sure they don't um, degrade our watersheds, I'm also uh, making sure that our own practices are as compliant as they can be with the law and as sensitive to the, the great biodiversity we have here as can be, all the while providing that drinking water to the city of Santa Cruz. So um, here's just, I call this our terrorist proof schematic of the water system. Um, we have to be cognizant of homeland security issues and public information sharing and whatnot. So it's hard to put out lots of system details. But in a nutshell, we have a very um, big and complex water system here which ranges from the north coast of Santa Cruz County uh, to about mid-county and then up into the San Lorenzo Valley at Loch Lomond Reservoir. Um, and some sections of the system still have redwood pipes. They're that old. That's, you know, early 20th century, late 19th century technology. Um, those are a few and far between nowadays, but just as an example, one of our water diversions is from 1888, I believe. So we have some very old infrastructure. And we also have um, a variety of listed species around our infrastructure, ranging from the Ohlone tiger beetle on the north coast to Pacific lamprey up in the San Lorenzo watershed. Um, the two species that are really driving our Endangered Species Act compliance work are the coho salmon and steelhead trout. Um, the red-legged frog is a, a close runner-up to those two as well. So I'm going to focus on the red-legged frog here, obviously, because there's more um, there's more interaction with bullfrog issues there. Um, some of the issues that we deal with that have potential for take, take being a term of art from the Endangered Species Act, um, are water diversion, pipeline repair, diversion maintenance, um, and just the, the copious limiting factors unrelated to our operations, be they predation by bullfrogs, um, collection, which I think is a fairly rare occurrence, but I have heard of that happening with red-legged frogs. Um, various other factors that are out there, the chytrid fungus, 
um, a lot of the things that Carrie has already gone over and are covered in much greater detail on the Save the Frogs webpage. Um, but what's interesting to me um, and what I've learned working on this water system is we find red-legged frogs in some of the weirdest places, or at least weird if you read the literature and weird if you have sort of the traditional understanding of frog habitat. But they're very opportunistic in areas where they're doing well, and basically any wet spot along Highway 1 up west of Santa Cruz and in northern Santa Cruz County, you can pretty much find a red-legged frog. So um, back when I first started working here 19 years ago or so, I would call Fish and Wildlife Service and tell them these things, and they weren't terribly surprised because they thought, well, that area of the coast, the red-legged frogs are just doing extremely well, um, and that I, that population probably extends up to Sharp Park as well, which I imagine was just jumping with red-legged frogs back in the day. Um, it was probably incredible habitat, as most of these coastal lagoons were, and in some cases still are. Um, so here's a ditch along Highway 1 by Wilder Ranch that, frankly, was full of frogs and tadpoles, believe it or not. When we were doing this work, we had a pipeline repair on a, I think it was about a 50 or 60 year old pipeline that had burst. Um, and you wouldn't think it's great habitat looking at it, but when you look closely, you notice, oh, there's tadpoles in the ditch and there's subadults scattered amongst the dirt clods, and it really uh, makes you rethink both the habits of the species, but also how challenging it is to maintain a water system. So here's another example of a city of Santa Cruz infrastructure where it's a dark redwood canyon, but it has just a little opening of sunlight, and the, the frogs have traveled up the stream channel from better habitat, most likely, and they found some basking sites here with great cover on the, the edge there. The, they jump off that bank, and there's an undercut, and it's 12 feet deep, and um, surprising to find frogs there when I first started out here because I thought it was too cold and shady, but the red-legged frogs, they're, uh, you know, they're adapted to this sort of transitional climate we have here between the sort of Southern California warmer Mediterranean climate and the Northern California wetter, darker conditions that we have on the coast. So um, they're pretty amazing creatures here. Here's another shot from that same diversion where we've got a red-legged frog that hopped off the uh, out of the grass there and hid under there. Probably that's his special hidey hole. They seem to be very particular about g jumping back to the same spot every time as far as I've seen um, next to a newt, which I thought was kind of neat. Um, here's that same frog actually at the diversion. Here's another picture of a red-legged frog. The first time I actually saw red-legged red frogs out in the field up in Bonnie Dune on the north coast, um, this frog was literally I don't know, 10 inches away from an adult steelhead trout in Laguna Creek. And uh, I had just never seen that, and a couple of herpetologists I spoke to had never seen that as well, and I thought that was pretty neat. So again, it speaks to the uh, frogs aren't always in quote unquote froggy habitat. Um, to see this reach a stream, you would never think it was froggy habitat, but this was early summer and things were warming mm -hmm. up, and the frogs were probably dispersing up and down the stream corridor, finding, you know, foraging opportunities. and various other things that they're looking for in the summertime. So another example of the city's in antiquated infrastructure and why we're, uh, we're getting up to speed on our Endangered Species Act compliance and dealing with created wetlands in a lot of cases. We have, you know, if we have uh, a couple thousand gallons a minute of water coming out of a pipe like this, we pretty quickly scour a hole, which the frogs are very opportunistic. They'll find that hole in a matter of days. Um, and oftentimes they find it much quicker than we do. So. Um, this is just part of the nature of our work, trying to manage the city water system and Endangered Species Act compliance. Here's another frog that found a pipeline leak and seems to be uh, pretty happy, although it, it does, again, make it challenging to conduct repairs and maintain our compliance when they're so difficult to detect buried in the vegetation and covered with mud. Um, it's a real um, leap of faith, so to speak, to, to think that the operations crews in the field and the maintenance crews can be safe when they're working around these creatures and we usually have to have environmental monitors on site to make sure that the, the safe is or the uh, scene is clear and there are no frogs that are going to be injured by the work so we're doing endangered species act compliance which in a nutshell consists of avoidance and minimization and i'll get into that a little further um, and then compensation for remaining effects and that's a those are a little bit terms of art which brent and some of the other folks on the call are probably familiar with um, basically, if we can't avoid and minimize our impacts on the frogs in their entirety, we have to come up with a way to compensate for that elsewhere. 
because we can't obviously we can't stop providing drinking water to 95,000 people, but we do have to try to modify that so it's at least um, the, the injury to those animals is mi minimized and we're providing some benefit elsewhere. Um, you know, it sounds like Shark Park might actually be an opportunity for similar folks like the city of Santa Cruz or other agencies who are regulated that need to do off-site mitigation. There's a, a built-in funding opportunity for restoration at that site. Um, so it uh, seems like there's some opportunities to think outside the box and think about win-wins. Um, when presenting this to folks like the city of San Francisco, who's only focused on the loss of the golf course, we might also present it as an opportunity to create a, some sort of opportunity for mitigation or even a revenue potential for the city of San Francisco where they create a mitigation bank for other people. So i um, interested in exploring that further with you guys later. Um, so avoidance and minimization. Here's an example of a pipeline on the north coast, a new pipeline reach um, to replace one of those old pipes. We put it over land um, and we use PE pipe, which is flexible, so it actually moves with the landscape. Um, we elevated the pipe to, so frogs could move up and down the stream corridor underneath it without um, getting pinned up against the pipe and having to travel literally hundreds of yards or even further to find a way around the pipe. Um, erosion control, of course, is a basic BMP for any construction project. Um, another practice we employ is putting platforms when we're going down to work on these pipeline reaches. We use platforms when we get into wetland areas. We obviously don't like to work in wetland areas, but you you know, if you've created a wetland through your lease, you're going to have to get in there and, and get wet and muddy. So we use these platforms to distribute the weight of the equipment so that we're not compacting the soil, thereby preventing them from restoring themselves as wetlands. Um, we do replanting, obviously, when we're done as well, but oftentimes in those wetland areas, Literally in a matter of weeks, the willows will just be sprouting like gangbusters after you get out of there. So oftentimes replanting is not necessary. Um, another avoidance and minimization measure that we employ all the time is just exclusion fencing. Um, you see a pipe right here coming from a pump where we're trying to dewater this hole that we created with a pipeline leak. And we'll have, I think it's quarter inch or maybe eighth inch mesh on the intake so that we're not drawing in frogs. Um, and we'll draw it out slowly. We'll draw the water out slowly that we can actually see the frogs as the water goes down and get them out of there while we're fixing the pipeline. So the remaining effects is where the bullfrogs come into play in the city of Santa Cruz's um, operations. We've got um, issues with chytrid um, collection I mentioned is probably again a minor issue. Loss of habitat is a big deal regardless of what the city of Santa Cruz does. You know a lot of our wetlands are gone as everyone knows. Um, our stream quarters are developed, the riparian quarters in the Santa Cruz Mountains. In most cases, there were logging roads running up every one of these creeks 100 plus years ago, and those logging roads got paved and cabins got put on every one of them. So our riparian corridors are encroached upon pretty much at every turn, and we've got limiting factors that are going to harm the, the red-legged frog in particular, regardless of what the city of Santa Cruz does to amend its um, operations to improve things for the frogs. So, We've got to focus on that as well, and that's where our work with Save the Frogs comes into play. So a couple of years ago, Kerry approached me at the County of Santa Cruz Fish and Game Commission, um, where I'm now the vice chair. I've been serving there for a few years, and the, the Fish and Game Commission, thankfully, was very eager to move forward on this and was successful in doing so. Concurrently, the city of Santa Cruz passed an ordinance to ban the, the possession, sale, transport, release, yada, 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 of live American bullfrogs within the city of Santa Cruz and on property owned and operated by the city of Santa Cruz. So that, that means that um, you can't, for instance, go to Loch Lomond, which is the city's reservoir up in the San Lorenzo Valley and release a bullfrog. Um, unfortunately, we now have a bullfrog invasion there and I'm not sure where they came from. It might be that they traveled up from the Roaring Camp Railroad Ponds which are sort of notorious hotspot for bullfrogs. It might be that one of our customers at Loch Lomond released bullfrogs as they were using them for bait or what have you. Um, but that's similar to the city and county of San Francisco. We own property outside of the city limits that we operate for municipal operations, um, although we don't have a golf course outside of the city limits. So here's the county code. Um, the county code is a little bit more thoughtful, I've got to say, than the city code. Um, but basically achieves the same thing. They didn't decide to um, characterize or specify that 
it applied to live bullfrogs only. So um, basically, all bullfrogs are banned for purchase, sale, offering for purchase. And you can read this right here under prohibitions. Um, and we were very proud about that as well. So with those victories under our belts, we just decided to move this on a statewide level. And Carrie's already told you a little bit about that with the, the petitions and the meetings with John Laird and Stafford Laird, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, formerly Fish and Game. Um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, obviously, is a state agency, and state agencies are, uh, as much as their policies are dictated by science, they're dictated by politics. So um, politics, as most people know, are not always um, as focused on science as those of us who are deep in the science would like. Um, and that's really where the rub is with getting a comprehensive and thoughtful statewide policy on bullfrogs. And, you know, really the question people ask us is why do we even care? Bullfrogs are already here. Um, in some cases they coexist with red-legged frogs, although my guess is that's not an optimal condition. The bullfrogs are great competitors. They're great predators. Um, they carry the chytrid fungus, obviously. Um, but we're, we're taking the next obvious step, and we're trying to get a comprehensive statewide policy change on bullfrogs. Um, to be fair, the Department of Fish and Wildlife did try to amend their permit process for bullfrogs, although, frankly, it, it really does not seem like a very forceful or, or um, forward-thinking approach toward bullfrog management. Um, and it requires more than policy changes, too. I mean, we've got to do work on the ground. We've got to do bullfrog eradication, which obviously people are not going to be too fond of. Even the frog lo lovers among us will not really cherish the day when they get to go out and kill bullfrogs. I mean, that's, most of us really love animals regardless of whether they're native or non-native. So that's, a, um, that's going to be a hard thing. That said, we've got, to, we've got to make some hard choices, you know, in defense of our native biodiversity. So as I mentioned, Carrie and I and others have been meeting with state legislators and uh, Secretary of Resources Laird, um, trying to figure out a path forward to get statewide policy changes. Um, so our next steps are probably to meet with resource, um, the uh, resources committee chairs, the, the legislators. We've been told that we need a legislative approach at changing this policy. Um, and that's really where the focus of this talk is going now. Um, we want to sign. We want to get lots of petition signatures. And Carrie showed you that petition online. The URL is right here. Um, and I think we have someone who's going to work on an electronic petition. Is that right, Carrie? Well, Carrie's probably muted. Um, but anyway, yes, that's we, correct. We're hoping to get an electronic petition up. Yeah. We will have an electronic um, we'll petition an electronic. soon. For now, for now, it's the paper okay. petition on SaveTheFrogs.com/bullfrogs. Yeah, and that petition's right here at this URL. Um, here's some things you can do in addition to that, but I think right now we'd really like to push folks to talk to their legislators about the bullfrog issue, um, to sign the petition, to circulate the petition, to bring that to attention that legislators this issue. A lot of the legislators are not up to speed on this issue, and frankly, if you read the water news and the, you know, all the other news about natural resource management issues in the state, bullfrogs unfortunately are not at the top of the list. We've got the Klamath water issues, we've got the Bay Delta issues, we've got of course water in the in Southern California on the Central Coast. We have extreme water supply problems right now ranging from the the uh, Salinas Valley with the development of all the vineyards over the last 10 or 15 years and the decline of the groundwater levels there. In the Scotts Valley area here in Santa Cruz County, the aquifer there has declined 150 feet in the last 25 years, which affects frogs. That's affecting base flows in the streams up in the Scotts Valley area, which ultimately feed the San Lorenzo system. So that's affecting the frogs, of course, as well. Um, that's affecting the Salmonids, the steelhead and the coho that we're trying to recover. Um, the city of Santa Cruz has water supply issues. Um, we have a up to a 50 percent or more deficit in our water supply in drought years um, look, looming ahead. And certainly with climate change, things are going to get worse especially as we look at more intense and infrequent storms, more flashy stream systems that have lower base flows in the summer, and then potentially higher temperatures in the summer so that people are irrigating more often and, and in a greater magnitude. So this is, uh, you know, there's kind of a, a collision of circumstances here which don't bode well for our native biodiversity. 
Um, so we really would like to focus, though, on in getting folks activated on this bullfrog issue right now. Um, and when you contact your legislators, talk to them specifically about adding bullfrogs to the list of prohibited species in Fish and Game Code Section 671. That code section has a list as long as my arm of species that are not allowed to be imported into the state, and there's various other prohibitions on them. Um, African clawed frog being one among them. Um, lots of other species for good reason. Bullfrog, there's really no reason why it shouldn't be on that list other than the politics behind, um, you know, various folks have a cultural or whatever uh, um, attachment to bullfrogs and the ability to engage in bullfrog commerce. Um, that said, I'm happy to report we've got a, an intern in my work group here at the city, Randy Holloway, who's been doing some research on that, calling restaurants and markets all over the state. And he's finding most of the frogs are coming in frozen. Um, and, and frankly, at, the, at least at the restaurant level and the market level, the potential for live frogs getting loose is pretty low. Um, of course, there's the wholesaler issue, which we've yet to track down and really do the research on. We've got to really identify the, you know, the conditions that the frogs come from the wholesalers in. And, and of course, the frogs are coming to the wholesalers, most likely from overseas, and there's those international biodiversity issues, which, frankly, the city of Santa Cruz has a hard time engaging in that when we've got so many big issues here locally. Um, but that's where the value in partnering with Save the Frogs is, because Save the Frogs um, thankfully is focused on an international level and approaching this more holistically. Um, but there is a, you know, the obvious next step there is to do some research on the wholesalers and the, just the whole chain of custody on frogs from, you know, where they're cultivated to how they get into California and dis distributed to the, uh, to the restaurants and markets. So that's our next step there. Um, we're currently in, uh, well, I always think of cat herding. We're tr trying to set up meetings with um, various legislators all over the state in the next few months. And uh, that's actually taking a lot of time just to figure out who's on first when. Um, and with uh, Save the Frogs moving the headquarters and Kerry being spread internationally now, it's a little bit challenging to do that. But thankfully, we have GoToMeeting and various other technologies. So we hope to get some meetings set up soon and, and start making some baby steps on this statewide push on bullfrog. So here's some key agency and legislative contacts. If folks want to make some focused outreach attempts, um, and I've emailed all these folks already and spoken to a few of them in person. So this it won't be uh, news to them that folks are starting to call them. Um, and we can certainly put their contact info out if folks need it. Um, you can email me or Carrie, and I'm sure we can put a list of, the, of their email and phone numbers on the Save the Frogs website. Um, and I just love this photo. It's a Michael Starkey, Save the Frogs Advisory Committee chair, took this photo, and it's just it's uh, it's cute. But when you really think of it on a biological level, it's uh, it's a little bit um, startling, to say the least. Um, it's it's just it's sort of like nature out of balance. It's it's just uh, it's sort of emblematic of the state of California and how we wrestle with our, our love for native biodiversity and open spaces and yet our ongoing um, impacts on that biodiversity just because of the sort of the vigorous international um, nature of this state. We have products and people and fauna and flora coming from all over the world at all times. I saw a, uh, some stat on the number of invasive species coming into San Francisco Bay every day is just alarming. Uh, and so we it is a little bit overwhelming to think about, but if we could make a dent in this in the bullfrog issue, I think we could consider that a success. So um, with that, if folks have questions, I'm happy to take them. There's my contact info down below. I know we're running late, but um, I thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, Chris. While I switch over back to my screen, why don't you tell people what those species were that we were just looking at in case they didn't know? The uh, backing up to the frog photo? Correct. Yeah, that's a red-legged frog in Anthoplexus with a bullfrog. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you very much, Chris Berry, for telling us about bullfrogs in California and all of the city and some of the county of Santa Cruz efforts to protect frog populations.
Let's see. If anyone has questions for me or Brent, please send them in. Brent, if you have any final thing to say related to some of the questions we heard, such as San Francisco's ESA compliance, then go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and you can tell us about that. Let me look at some of these questions. Again, anyone, if you have any questions, please send it in. Yeah, I can answer the take question really quickly, Carrie. We actually, I'm an attorney and we, we actually do a fair amount of litigation at Wild Equity and we did bring a lawsuit against the city and county of San Francisco, which was successful, alleging that the city was illegally taking under the Endangered Species Act both species, the California red-legged frog and the San Francisco garter snake. And that lawsuit was successful and the city was required to apply for a permit from the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to continue the operations of the golf course. And a permit was issued um, not that long ago. And so at the moment, our legal team is looking over that permit to determine if we should challenge it or not. And there's several uh, legal complications that I won't bore you with here about when or how we might uh, move forward with those challenges. Um, but that litigation is ongoing. And these campaigns that have multiple strategies, and you know, we have a legislative strategy, strategy that Kerry alerted to, we have this litigation strategy, we have the education strategy, which resulted in the report that was peer-reviewed and described the restoration opportunities at Sharp Park. They, the way they tend to go is you find some actor who is violating an environmental law without any permits at all, just blatantly violating it. You can sue and win those cases then they have to run and apply for a permit. Eventually they obtain a permit. You have to sue over the content of the permit. You can do that a couple of times, but eventually the courts will grow tired of that trajectory. And in the interim, you need to make sure that your education campaign is aligned properly with your uh, legislative campaign so that you get a political victory to end the practices that are causing the harm. And so that's the phase we're in right now is, is um, ensuring that the Board of Supervisors, who's consistently supported our plan, has enough political clout, clout to overcome these, you know, just very narrow-minded interests of San Francisco's new mayor. As Kerry said, he's, he just happens to be a huge recreational golfer, doesn't really have any background in environmental issues. We don't haven't had an environmental uh, mayor in San Francisco for the past couple of years now because of it, um, and, and, and work those different elements of our campaign successfully so they leverage enough political clout to ultimately get San Francisco to restore Sharp Park. Thanks a lot for that, Brent. I want to add something related to what Chris said about frozen bullfrogs coming into the state. There are plenty of bullfrogs that come in frozen, but to be clear, there are plenty of live animal markets where the bullfrogs come in live and are sold in buckets where they're in very close proximity to each other. Many frogs in a bucket, as you've likely seen a picture for, we have one up on this web page. There we go. Lots of frogs in water, in a bucket. Chytrid fungus is a skin disease with waterborne zoospores. So if you're in water and you're touching the skin of lots of frogs, which all these frogs are touching each other and swimming in each other's water, Perfect disease spreading conditions. And then, Harry, can I say a word? You sure? Yeah. Uh, this is Chris. I just, I thanks for that clarification. We, um, we do acknowledge that in our research, we, we were really only able to reach out to, um, I'll just use shorthand, legitimate operations that we had addresses and phone numbers for. Um, there's a, a huge market. Um, you know, most distinctly, I think of some of the urban areas where there's live food markets on the sidewalks, and it's just um, much more challenging to reach out to that community for a variety of reasons. So it is very much true that there, there are live bullfrogs being sold everywhere, and I, and I hope I didn't give people the wrong impression there. We've only done research of restaurants and markets at this point. Okay, thanks. And just another clarification that while it does seem difficult for a bullfrog to escape the city, some people, as I said, actually buy these animals and they think they're doing a service to 
society by releasing the frogs into wild into the wild so they can be free. And these people don't realize that the bullfrogs are causing harm when they get out into the wild. So on the topic of live animal markets, we got a note from Miles Young, a former fish and game warden who went to lots of these markets and says that we already have California Code of Regulations, Title 14, Section 236 in place which allows the California Department of Wildlife to require inspections for live imports. It requires the importer to pay the inspection fees, the salaries and transportation costs for the Department of Fish and Wildlife personnel. And that the department can choose to inspect a location. Diseased animals must be destroyed or transported out of the state. And If these were enforced, then the live animal markets would likely cease to exist due to all the um, problems that would be encountered in trying to get these frogs into the state and show that they're disease free, which they tend to not be. So the California Department of Fish and Wildlife could be using their Title 14, Section 236 abilities to help out, but As I said before, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife is, from my experience, taking the approach of they don't want to change the status quo. They don't want to take any actions other than continuing to doing what they've been doing, which from my viewpoint is nothing other than permitting the importation of millions of harmful non-native frogs into the state to the detriment of California's ecosystems, frog populations, and people who have to pay the cost of endangered species compliance and the aesthetic loss of um, frog populations and wildlife from our state. So the California Department of Fish and Wildlife should step up their game, take some responsibility, and if they truly think they're legally not allowed to do anything, then they should take the responsibility to start talking to the politicians in the state who do have the ability to make a difference. So to take no action and also to say that they have no responsibility is thoroughly incorrect and unethical and a waste of taxpayer money. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife should start taking responsibility and anyone at the Department of Fish and Wildlife who's listening to this, and I hope many people do, I'm happy to meet with any of you to talk about ways to get these bullfrogs to not be coming into the state of California any longer. On that note, unless anyone has any final questions, then we're going to call that an end. So please chat in your questions while I show you some upcoming Save the Frogs events. And to let you know, the video of this class will go up to youtube.com slash save the frogs very shortly. You can also try save the frogs.com slash YouTube and that'll get you there too. We've got videos from our recent class on Save the Frogs Ghana coming up in Sacramento very soon. Uh, We will be at the Nature Fest with the table. International Day of Pesticide Action coming up October 12th. If anyone's interested in pesticides and wants to get involved with that, please let me know. We'll be at the Wildlife Conservation Expo in San Francisco October 12th. Any artists out there, October 15th, Save the Frogs Art Contest closes. Save the Frogs Poetry Contest closes October 15th. So get in your submissions. We'll be up in Sonoma, California soon, as well as St. Cloud, Minnesota at the Global Social Responsibility Conference. So if you know people in Minnesota, let them know about that. AT&T Park Bay Area Science Festival. We'll have a Save the Frogs information table there. If you want to go to Sharp Park and Maury Point, that Brent Plater from the Wild Equity Institute told us all about. 
If you want to go see live California red-legged frogs, we will be out looking for them November 3rd, Pacifica, California, 15 or 20 minutes south of San Francisco. Come outside to a beautiful location, learn all about Sharp Park, get to see some California red-legged frogs, assuming that they're out showing their faces, which they sometimes are. We'll be at the Swan Festival in Marysville, California, and then coming up in April, Save the Frogs Day worldwide events. Wherever you are located, we would love for you to get involved. We'll be back in Belize June 19th to 28th, leading a Save the Frogs eco tour, taking you out to show you beautiful tropical ecosystems and all the amazing wildlife that lives there. SaveTheFrogs.com slash Belize or SaveTheFrogs.com slash Ecotours. Okay, this is Save the Frogs Academy. I am Dr. Carrie Krieger, founder and executive director of Save the Frogs. I thank Brent Plater and Chris Berry for educating us about California amphibian conservation issues. Thanks to all of you for being on this call and attending Save the Frogs classes. I forgot to mention we have more California frog conservation classes coming up on October 2nd and 13th. We will have guest speakers telling you all about the mountain yellow-legged frogs, which are critically endangered. That's October 2nd and 13th. Info on savethefrogs.com slash academy, where you can register for those classes. All right. Have a great day. Bye.